Hello everyone, welcome to the Figurines Crisis Center. I would also like to thank those of you that are joining us uh, via Zoom uh, this afternoon. Uh, we'd also like to take this time to acknowledge all the presence here with us and uh, for also taking out the opportunity uh, to join us for this uh, significant event. Um, uh, we, we are actually very happy to host this event um, and have a uh, Pacific journalist here with us, um, Nick McCallum. And today's event has been made possible uh, through a partnership uh, between the Pacific Network of Globalization, the Pacific Conference um, Churches, and also the Fiji Women's Crisis Center. Um, I also would like to convey the apologies of the FWCC coordinator, Shamima Aoun. I'm not going to She's currently at the FWCC in 1990. However, Shamima would like to thank Mr. Kelly for agreeing to be part of this event this afternoon. And uh, she has very fond memories of Mr. Kelly's work in the Pacific um, during the decolonization and also the uh, nuclear free movement. I used to live in Gordon Street across the road, so I'm a neighbour. <laughs> um, yes, so I'd like to take this time to now invite uh, Joey from M for further introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Billy, and um, welcome to all our participants online um, and those that are present here at the FWCC Conference Centre. Um, on behalf of the on behalf of um, Mrs. C and Perry, uh, we're grateful to our host, the Thank Fiji Women's Crisis Center. Thank you for extending your space to convene uh, this important Talanoa. I guess it's very timely at the back of the recent French elections. Um, it provides us an opportunity to Talanoa and talk about uh, for this discussion. Uh, to tell us, uh, speak and share his experience uh, for over 40 decades of reporting on Kanaki in Taidonia. I guess Nick does not need any introduction uh, for those that are joining us online and those who may uh, be joining this space uh, for the first time. Nick is a, a, a very common name in the, in, in the media in the Pacific. Um, and we are so honored to have him here to provide us um, his journalistic views of how he's seen uh, his coverage of New Caledonia, uh, Kanaki, uh, his engagements with Kanaks, not just Kanaks, but the leaders of Kanaki, um, and how he's reported over the years and how he draws those past experience to where Taraki New Caledonia is. Uh, he is a popular contributor again to the island's business, uh, columnist to so many uh, regional um, media platforms. Again, we are more really well, you know, happy to have you here with us today. And we extend a welcome to our virtual participants too, as well, uh, who will allow me to make a presentation. Uh, if we could ask uh, participants to please have your minds muted uh, until and when um, Nick opens it up for Talanoa. We would like to make it more interactive. If you are able to pose any questions, uh, please do have them in the chat box, which are attacked from our amazing tech team. will uh, bring them up on the floor. Uh, but again, we do welcome you online, and again, Thank you, Nathan. Welcome. Well, thank you, the hosts, to Rosa and Joey, and Maureen from Pang, to Padre JB, representatives of the Pacific Conference of Churches, particularly to the Fiji Women's Christ Centre. Um, I lived in Fiji many, many years ago. Um, I was literally across the road. I failed miserably one. They went across the civil rights and said, Oh, if anyone comes and goes down into that residence, you should tell us. And they built down the building next no, the building next door during the 2000 coup, and I slept all through it. So it's pretty much a security guard. Um, thank you, FWCC, 
friends online. Um, I was described in the blurb as a respected regional journalist, and some of my younger journalistic colleagues say, you're not respected, you're just old. <laughs> um, but being old, and I am, that has some advantages, you have a sense of history. So what I want to do today is to do a very quick sweep over the crisis in New Caledonia and end up a bit with a discussion about what it means for the NSG, for the Forum, for Australia, and for big people from the region. I can talk under wet concrete, so I'll try and keep it short. So we've got a lot of time to share, discuss, tell them all later. And as suggested, questions from the many people. Thank you for joining us online. Um, and so on. We'll have a PowerPoint and share the screen. And I'll use some images to tell a bit of a story. Um, most of you will know that New Caledonia, <coughs> off the coast of Queensland in Australia, has been breaking the colonial boundaries in recent years to engage with neighbouring countries. Um, the people of New Caledonia, indigenous Kanak people, Melanesian people, the many people who come as prisoners, as free settlers, as indentured labourers and so on, have built a complex and diverse society. It's hit the headlines since the 13th of May because of the political, social, cultural crisis facing the people, and I want to touch on that today. Most of you, I'm sure, know a bit about New Caledonia, so for those who don't, I'll just do a little bit of 101, and I have feel respect for those who've been there, worked there, lived there. The main island, Grand Terre, central mountain range, full of nickel, strategic resource of great importance, some 20 odd percent of the world's reserves of nickel, it's a crucial part of the economy. The outlying loyalty islands, Yai, Rubea, <coughs> Grim, Lipu, Tiga, Ngone, Mare, majority Kanak population in the islands, majority Kanak population in the north of the country, the main island. But the capital, Namia, is in the south, and there are three provinces that I'll mention quite a lot the southern province, <coughs> the northern province, the law of the islands province. The southern province, the capital, Namia, is a large non kanak population. Maybe 75% of the population is non kanak both French, people that are Kaladosh, long-term New Caledonians of European heritage. People come from Wallace and Katuna. There are more Walesians in New Caledonia than there are in Wallace. Many came in the 60s and 70s to work in the nickel industry, and they've never gone home. Um, that mix is complex and the fundamental issue is that the indigenous Kanak people, and the people as a nation in waiting, um, are the sovereign people, and how they engage with other New Caledonians, many who were brought against their will as prisoners, as indentured labourers and so on, their descendants, is at the heart of this crisis. So, if we can flip forward. I took this photo in 1985. I was a young trade union activist and travelled to New Caledonia and attended a congress. The FLNKS, the Kanak Socialist National Liberation Front, was created in September 1984. So we're heading towards the 40th anniversary of the FLNKS. This congress was in 1985. And on the right, you can see two leaders standing, Ueni uh, Ueni, and sitting next to him, Jean-Louis Chabal. Jabal was a charismatic Kanak leader, came out of the churches, organised festivals in 1975 to promote Kanak culture and identity. An amazing man. Tragically, Jabal and Yueni were assassinated in 1989. I don't have time to go into the details. The name Chabal rings through history. He was one of the greatest philosophers of the Pacific, and it's a name that people recognise. So, fast forward to today. His son, Emmanuel, has just been elected to the French National Assembly. Emmanuel is um, uh, young, from the Empire of in his 40s. Um, sitting beside him is Amandine Daras, who is an 
environmentalist, wonderful young woman involved in environment campaigns in New Caledonia. Uh, she's the Kalosha, New Caledonian of European heritage. And aged in their 30s and 40s, they symbolise a, a new generation. And that's part of the story I want to tell today because it's happening in every Pacific society that young people are stepping up to positions of responsibility um, to deal with the history that they've drawn. And I think the symbolism of Jean-Marie Chabal being there 40 years ago as a Canac leader and his son stepping up as a Canac leader, the name Chabal rings today just in the rank at that time. Frankly, that's one of the reasons he got elected. You know, if you're a young kid voting for the first time, don't know much about politics, <laughs> you know the name. And this is a man, he's not a politician, he's a cultural worker. He was head of the Jewelry Chabal Cultural Centre in our works in the northern province of New Caledonia as their cultural direction. So he's very strong on custom and identity. And um, interesting. And for the first time since 1986, there is now a Canadian independence leader in the French National Assembly. It's a really significant Thank you. The statue on the left is his father. After the armed conflict of the 1980s, um, the clashes between supporters and opponents of independence, the militarised French deployments in those times, led to the famous handshake. Chabal, on behalf of the FNKS, uh, Jacques Lafleur, now passed away, the leader of the anti-independence Rassemblement Party, and they signed an agreement known as the Matignon Accord to end the conflict, which had culminated in the Uvea massacre of 1988, led by uh, a crisis, young Kanak activist Alphonse Bianu and others. <laughs> they didn't resolve the problems, and 10 years later, an agreement was signed called the Namir Accord. Um, and this is the handshaking going on. Um, the guy with the white hair in the middle is the then French Prime Minister, Leonard Jospin. On the left, Rock Momiton, uh, leader of the largest independence party. On the right, Lafleur, once again, the handshake, trying to forge a deal that could address concerns from both supporters and opponents of independence. Okay. I won't go into too much of this. I've written about it, but I think it's just worth flagging because the Namir Accord is quite unique. Rather than have a referendum in 1998 to decide whether they would be independent, they put off the question for a generation. It's a model that's been followed, say, in Bougainville. Indeed, this was signed in 1998, and the Bougainville peace negotiators used the same model to put off the decision, and Bougainville only had its referendum after the war in 2019, and that process is still underway. So the model of what's happened there is important for other regions in the well, what they agreed was that there would be a transition and that powers would pass from France, the government of France, to the government of New Caledonia. They create new political institutions, so decentralized provinces, three provinces, north, south, lower the islands, that each had their own provincial administrations. Paris would bankroll, important feature, this transition and over time hand over powers of many or parts of the authority to the government and Congress of New Caledonia. I'll give you one example, education. In 2000, New Caledonia got control of primary education. And in 2012, secondary education. Um, and they went through this elaborate process to rewrite all the social studies textbooks so the new New Caledonian curriculum textbook on geography says our neighbours, the Australians, not our neighbours, the Germans. Um, the history process was really interesting. There's a wonderful book written about how they had to integrate world history, French history, and Kanak history, Oceanian history, into what they teach in the schools. And they brought vernacular languages into the primary schools so kids learn English and French and Paichi, and I had to get dictionary. So there's been 
you know, that's just one example. There's health and there's environment in many areas. But France held what they call the sovereign powers, defense, foreign policy, currency, police, courts. By Nick Hold up to this day. McKellen. 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 McClellan. Um, this yeah. is really a moment where people in your colony are grappling with all the global challenges that we're, we're doing. The other unique element, and this is crucial for this current situation, it created for the first time in French law the notion of New Caledonian citizenship. And that's unique in French law. France is a universal republic. So if you live in Tahiti, French colony and French Polynesia, you vote for the European Parliament because you're part of Europe. You're French. Um, they have the full rights of French citizenship. But the Namir Accord created this unique notion that there is a Kanak people. There is a new Caledonian citizenship. And that's embedded in the French constitution. And that's not true. There is no such thing as the Maui people. There are French people of Tahitian heritage, but aren't, you know. So this was a breakthrough. And the Kanak people and other supporters of independence from other ethnic communities have been struggling to protect this notion that we are not French. We are New Caledonian. And New Caledonian joined the Pacific Islands Forum as a full member in 2016. So it's part of this process. Okay. The problem is, they moved culminating to a series of referendums. Another unique element was that after the transition um, from the powers, there would be at the culmination of the Namir Accord, not one, but up to three votes on self-determination, asking, we've handed over health, we've handed over education, do we want to hand over these final powers around defence, around currency, around sovereignty, basically the sovereign powers, the powers that say we're an independent state. First referendum in 2018, uh, second in 2020, third in 2021. And the idea was that if people vote no the first time, they can have another go. And that's pretty amazing. Like, it wasn't a win-loss. What happened, however, was that people were expecting the Canucks would do and the independence movement would do really badly in the first referendum. <laughs> I was there reporting at the time, and the common sense sort of smart people were saying they'll get 25, 30%. The dream of independence is over. They had their chance, it's done. And when they got 43%, people were shocked on all sides because the young people came out and voted, and they hadn't been particularly interested in politics all during the years, but um, I interviewed Daniel Gore, the president of the largest independence party union, Caledonia, and he said, we lost on the numbers, but it was a great victory. They didn't win. They only got 43%, but that's close enough to 50 to feel we can do this. <laughs> it was called in 2020, as you can see, a few more percentage points. Once again, it was a no vote, but just getting closer, tantalisingly closer, the 50s. Then there was a change of government in France. They ditched Edouard Philippe, the Prime Minister. New people came in and they decided that rather than hold the next one as promised in late 2022, after the French presidential and legislative elections, that they'd rush it through before the presidential elections in April 2022. But if you remember 2021, we were the COVID pandemic. Um, New Caledonia avoided the worst of COVID in the first year. Um, but then in 2021, there was a big surge, September, October, November, hundreds of people dying, people in mourning, particularly poorer people, Kanak, Malaysian and others were bearing the brunt of this. So they said, don't do this, we can't do this. France decided for strategic reasons to forge ahead. And Kanak and independent supporters just stayed away from the polls, they just didn't vote, and voting is not compulsory. So... As you can see, the turnout partner, the less than one in two people voting, and it'd be very high, really high, because normally people turn about 60%, 80% came. They knew this was important. And when the supporters of independence stayed away, turnout part 
And as you can see, 3.5% of the people voted yes. It was disciplined, it was peaceful. Every town hall was there, independent politicians sitting there as mayor waiting for people to come vote, they didn't vote. It was an amazing day. The French courts say, well, you had your chance, it was a valid vote, bad luck. One, two, three, you lost. I'm summarising, they're much more diplomatic than that. <laughs> um, however, from the beginning, the third referendum has been contested, whether legally it's valid, politically, it has no legitimacy and credibility. And indeed, the Pacific Islands Forum had a mission there observing Henry Puna, the Secretary General, Dr. Inoki Kumbabola, Foreign Minister of Fiji, uh, Victoria Lasaya from Samoa, UN Ambassador previously, and they put out a report which is on the Forum website. Uh, they only put it up recently, which is interesting. Um, I got a copy of it off the back of a truck at the time, um, but it's now a public document. And they criticised the legitimacy of this vote on the basis that New Caledonia is what the UN calls a non-self-governing territory. France is the administering power of a non-self-governing territory. That's UN speak for its colony. And so as a colonial power, France has responsibilities to lead the country. And here we are a quarter of the way through the 21st century, and there's still an issue. So both the French state and the anti-independence leaders, like Sonia Bucket, Nicholas Metzfeld, and others in the media say, well, we had three votes, it's over, and now we need to move on. And the airplane pairs have been saying for the last few years, this was rigged. It's really simple, the voting thing. And I'll just take... Um, <laughs> <laughs> there are three different electoral roles. One for French citizens. So people voted on Sunday. All French nationals, 18 years and above, voted for the president. Similarly for the European Parliament. But people don't actually vote for the European Parliament. 13% of people turn out because it's Parliament on the other side of the world. Why don't they? But they have the right to. There's a restricted electorate for the local political institutions. And basically, there's a cutoff date. So people born there, people were there by 1998. But there's now many French nationals, French citizens, who can't vote for the Congress, the assemblies. And the French have been pushing to expand that notion of New Caledonian citizenship. And most of those people vote against the independence. So people are saying, OK, let's talk about it, but it's part of an overall deal. And that's the problem. So you have French, French nationals. I took that photo years ago when there were 23,000 French people living in New Caledonia who wouldn't vote. Now you're saying we're excluded but proud to be French. So now that figures up to 40,000. So the 40,000 people living there who can't vote because they're not New Caledonian. And France is trying to change that. They're trying to expand who gets to count as a New Caledonian to vote for the local local Congress, the presidency there. And, surprise, surprise, independence sort of reluctant. So this is a graph I took out of a Senate report. I won't go into all the details, but you get the idea. That's all the French voters. That's the referendum voters. That's who can vote for the local institutions. And they're adding another 14.5% to who can vote. That's the plan. What Macron, you know, you've read about Macron trying to push this law through. Now, for a country of 270,000 people, adding 25,000 extra voters is a good and that's why there's been all this argument about voting rights to define who's there. And so there was a series of rallies organised by the CCAT, which is a network of people not just from the main independence coalition, but church people, but they trade unionists, uh, lots of people came together under this banner. On the 13th of April, there were huge rallies in the media by both supporters and opponents of independence. So 30,000 people, it's estimated, march, marching. Now, in, in Fiji, that would mean about 120,000 people marching down the street. Have you ever seen a rally that big in Fiji? Like, it was huge. It was peaceful. It was disciplined. And people said, don't do it. Don't try and ram these electoral reforms through the parliament. 13th of April. And a month later, President Macron took this constitutional reform, redefining New Caledonia citizenship, to the National Assembly on the 13th 
of May. And that night, young people went out on the streets. They torched the Porsche dealership. <laughs> Interesting, but there's a Porsche dealership in the mayor. <laughs> they torched Société de Foix, which is the bottling company. People ask me, why are they burning down the Coca-Cola plant? It's owned by the La Fleur family, Chuck La Fleur, the guy here. And then they, that was my hand. Terrible damage. And we can talk about that later. Cars burnt, shots looted, riots, and the police are there. And that trauma continues to this day, where although it's calmer now, France has deployed police forces, um, and it's a, a significant issue in its own. One of the drivers is that the mayor is a very odd place. When I first went there in the 1980s, it was known as Ville Blanche, White City. <laughs> it's the only place in the city you can do in the shops by white people. Now, that's changed. Like every city, people move from the regional areas. So there's now the southern province got maybe 25,000 connect people, and they come to the cities like they do in Fiji or in Australia or anywhere. Education, employment, enjoyment, you know, migration from the rural areas. So there's quite a big connect population growing in the city. But it's, it's, I always say it's a city of yachts and squats. This is the CNC Yacht Harbour and the luxury apartment. So one of the southern suburbs of Namia are incredibly wealthy, even by Pacific standards. You know, GDP per capita, New Caledonia has the highest GDP than New Zealand. It's a rich place. But the benefits of that go to very few people. And so you have French public servants on enormous salaries and bonuses. They live a very comfortable life. They have their yachts and so on. And they live in a bubble in the southern parts of Namia. And yet there are young people. These were uh, 2018 young voters, connect voters. There's about six or 8,000 people living in smaller settlements. So every Pacific city grapples with this, the peri-urban settlements and the divisions between the haves and haves not it's not rocket science, that there's enormous gaps. I won't bombard you with too many figures, but there's a pretty simple one. Tour de chômage, unemployment rate. Canac, non-Canac. It's double. So young Canacs have got double the unemployment rate of people of non-Canac heritage. Education. This is, a, this is a 2019 census, so it's a bit out of date, but nothing's changed. So it's taken a long time to change the education system, and now the government of New Caledonia is changing it to redo the curriculum to be a Pacific curriculum, not a French curriculum. But they only got control of secondary education in 2012. It's only a decade ago. So there's a long way to go. Once again, I won't bore you with too much, but it's pretty simple. This is no diploma degree. Revenue College is like 16 year old certificate, leave a certificate. 45% of Canucks don't have a leave a certificate, let alone a degree. Walesians, Islanders who migrated, similar sort of figures. Europeans, 10%, levels. So that disparity in educational opportunities, even after a couple of decades of transition, there has been enormous progress around education and training because the government of New Caledonia is transforming things, but so slow. And if you're a young person living in the Scottish settlements and you see this poverty of urban life, the voting changes, the scenes of trigger, and that's why we've seen this explosion. So the Connect youth are out on the streets waving the flag of Kanaki, the symbol of Kanak nationalism, but it's also about the poverty of urban life, dignity for young people. And the anger that we see everywhere around the world is not just the New Caledonia problem. You look at Solomon's. I was here during the 2000 riots where people went trash crowds and so on. It's a Pacific white problem. Thank you. We'll be able to the next one. And so you've seen young kids out on the barricades. Only blokes, a bit of testosterone um, in the way, and that's an issue, um, but waving the flag of Kanaki. Um, and uh, the country throughout late May was spreading. <laughs> France's response, 
funny because it's actually from 1997 because the same thing happened during its encounter from the mall. The uh, guy is saying, ah, oh, New Caledonia, the charm of the natives, the palm trees, the sun, the sea, um, and the CRS right squads. That's what it was like when I was there in the 1980s. And if you've seen the news, that's what it's like today. Um, thank you. So there are 3,700 um, Garde Mobile, um, Gendarme, CRS riot squads. They brought six big armoured cars. The military has been deployed for logistic and technical purposes. And as you can see, these sort of Robocop outfits, these are not Mr. Plot, these are people. And there's a, can I say, a particularly French tradition that the French, if you've ever seen pictures in France with the Gilets Jaunes movement or farmers or trade unionists, they're pretty tough coppers. I talked to a Kanak leader, though, and he said, and I think he was worried, our kids are not scared of the cops. And I think this is an important issue for the Pacific, governments and civil society. You can't police your way out of poverty. And we saw this with Ramsey, for example, the Regional Assistance Mission of Solomon Islands. Over 14 years, Australia deployed $3 billion and Pacific countries sent police officers, every Pacific country from New Way upwards, sent police officers to the Solomons. 83% of the Ramsey budget over 14 years was spent on law and justice. The law of it was on law, not on justice. And I think that's the challenge that is happening for New Caledonia. It's a challenge everywhere in the world. What resources are going to strengthen the people who keep the peace? Women's groups, thank you to our hosts. You know, church leaders, customary leaders and chiefs, people of respect, young people who hold mana in their community and can do pre and <coughs> education. This is not rocket science. This is development 101. This is humanity 101. Mm -hmm. And I don't think France is learning lesson because they think they can calm this down by guys like this. Mm -hmm. I understand that the police have a job to do, that the courts have a job to do, <coughs> but... Thank you. This is the state of play at the moment, and this is the mood at the moment. And when France decided to send, uh, they arrested 11 key leaders from the uh, CC18 movement who'd been organising both the peaceful protests for months and are alleged to have organised the riots. Um, they've sent seven of the 11 prisoners in jail in France and scattered them, not in one prison, but in seven different prisons. So if you're the lawyer representing them, you've got to go not to Paris, but to Moulos, to Dijon, to Bourges, to uh, the Auvergne, like it's deliberate. And that sparked another round of anger for people feeling that their leaders would be blamed for a much bigger crisis. The space though, is it's a Pacific society. And Fijians will understand this. Even through the worst of times, there is a strength in the community. There are networks, there is culture, there is pride. So here's a picture taken by a colleague of mine in um, uh, Borai town. You can see on the right some of the local Kaldosh, people of European heritage, Kanak youth, Kanak elders, saying, how can we stop the rioting and mayhem that's going on in Namia? from affecting our town. And in Pontimia, there was a bunya, a traditional feast, where they brought the local shopkeepers who were quite worried there, the supermarket was going to get looted. No, no, not going to happen here. Um, a friend of mine who lives in Kone, a Walesian guy, said, oh, we're doing night patrols. We have a Kanak, a European, and a Walesian. We go out and say, hey, kids, go on, you know, stop the young men getting into causing trouble. So there is community resilience and that needs support. And can I say, guys in shields and helmets are not the people who build on that, to support the people. I don't have to tell people in Fiji who've been through some tough times and rebuilt. Okay. <clears throat> the other piece of these people are leading. They have tough times in New Caledonia. Once again, like I've been seeing, soil migra net migration. So the birth rate, soil natural, going up a bit. Migration, increasingly people are leaving. I don't have to get into the details of it. They've had the referendum, a period of uncertainty. 
you're a French national. You can't vote for the local institutions. Three referendums. You thought the Canucks were going to lose, and they got 43 for that. <laughs> well, next time they got 47 for that. So you think, yeah. Then there was COVID. And all of us went through COVID with the social, economic, cultural trauma of the period, lockdowns and things like that. Then the nickel industry is in crisis, crucial industry. You know, we've got time to go into it, but they've had energy problems, capital being withdrawn. It's a mess. And it's a big employer. Jobs, livelihoods, future. And then this last two months. So I think when we get the figures for 2023 and 2024, they'll be higher than 2000. Because if you're a business person wanting to invest, you don't even know who the government in Paris is. <laughs> I don't know how much of you read the papers in the last few days, but there's chaos in Paris. Mm -hmm. They don't know who's going to be prime minister. They don't know who. And New Caledonia is just not on the agenda. They're worried about Ukraine and Russia and racism and national front and, you know, very low on the totem pole. And that's why the explosion of violence and anger has caught attention for a while. But now the Australian and New Zealand tourists are out, the attention's dropping off. <laughs> and uh, so just like, that's what Australian journalists can I say? <laughs> I'm still writing, not many people are. Okay. There are partners, and you can transcend the language barriers. Many of you in the room I know have got friends, colleagues. Mark Claymore, Pacific Conference of Churches, held their assembly there last November. Churches knew this was coming because they're grounded in the people. So Reverend Bhagwan and the others held the meeting there last year. I was proud to be there. Um, the churches talking about what do we play the role of, you know, churches. Trade unionists, that's Melanie Apple, that's Apple, president of the USDA. Yeah. 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 Local reference here. Yeah. Strong women, trade unionists, church leaders, and so on. Customary chiefs. There are partners. <laughs> And beyond what governments do at the forum and the MSG, we need to think creatively on how we engage with our counterparts in New Caledonia because they need help. Whether it's politically or just simply to rebuild their lives, the violence against women, the knowledge that you people have is so crucial because the boys who have been out on the barricades are coming home and some of them are carrying guns and you know what that means. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what do we do? I'll leave that for discussion. They're young. They're Pacific Islanders. The population is young. And what we're seeing is the young people who heard all the stories from their grandparents about the conflict of the 1980s. Now they've got their own war stories. <laughs> they've got their experience of trying to say, we are connected, we're not going anywhere. This is our country. How do we engage with those young people who are grappling with everything that young people here grapple with. Social media, TikTok, which got banned, the French banned TikTok in the first few weeks because they knew what young people were doing with their fellow hikes. Um, life, sex, drugs, jobs, family. How are you going to be able to buy a house? Climate change, climate change, climate change. New Caledonia is no different than any other city on the country. And the young people there are grappling with the same problem that the Vigians and so on and so on are grappling with. My final comment, because I'm going on. The banner says, we will never renounce, never give up the dreams of our fathers. Yeah. That was a rally held before the current explosion. And it's a way of saying a new generation is grappling with how do we move towards an independent sovereign nation. And it's complex because unlike many places, Bougainville, 97% of people voted for independence. Here, can they make up about 42% of the population. So they have to get support from our communities, from Wallace, from Europeans, from people of whatever ethnicity to build, and the language was to build a common destiny, to work together. That destiny is a bit fractured at the moment. People are pretty traumatized. What can we as neighbours do to contribute to bringing stuff together? People know there's a rally here. Good idea. They're watching. They watched Fespac. My phone went, bong, 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 bong. Chamorro delegation 
carry the flag of Kanaki in the best bag. Because the tomorrow, the indigenous people of Guam are going through this as well. And they got one delivery basis from us. Yeah. So this is Bougainville, West Papua, Kanaki. This is part of the Royal Pan. Okay. Final point. <coughs> President Macron. I was the only foreign journalist who went there. I actually took this photo. He was there literally kissing babies. <laughs> <laughs> I was very slow to get kissed, but like, you get the idea. Um, he flew in again on the 23rd of May, 18 hours, and captured the headlines. You've come to resolve the problem. Can I say, the problem is not resolved. <laughs> And as I say, if you read the papers, many people I've been on the phone to, both supporters and opponents of independence, they're worried that France has got bigger problems than dealing with this crisis. Mm -hmm. So there is a role for us in the Pacific, Australia, New Zealand, four island countries, Middle East Spear Group. It's only a month or so till the quarrel. Um, I'm getting on France. Finally, um, Fiji has played an important role. Ambassador Tarakini King in New York, Fiji and Papua New Guinea are members of the Special Committee on Decolonization, and members of uh, um, the SPEA group. Historically, the Ethelene KS, the independence movement, is a full member of the MSG. Um, what's the Rambuka government going to do? Can I leave that to the government of here in your own internal affairs? I'm old enough to remember that when Colonel Rambuka had a coup in 1987 in Australia and New Zealand cut off military aid. France provided Renault you know, trucks um, <laughs> to the Fiji government. I'll clear with that. Fiji citizens might want to think about how their government will act in the lead up to the forum. <laughs> I'll say no more. I'm an Australian citizen because I'm facing the same question. Um, Australia is riding two horses. We have a strategic partnership with France, particularly around the Indo-Pacific agendas, military and so on. As Richard Miles being greeted by Sebastian Le Corman, the French Armed Forces Minister last December, uh, Australia and France hosted the South Pacific Defence Minister's meeting in New Caledonia. First time ever that France had hosted them, because New Caledonia is a member of the forum but doesn't control defence and foreign policy issues. So France kindly offered to go to the South Pacific Defence Minister's meeting on their behalf. So that's the Indo-Pacific stuff. Penny Wong, the Foreign Minister, however, made the first visit by an Australian Foreign Minister to New Caledonia last year, met uh, the current president, Louis Mapu, Kanak, from independence politician. They took climate, they took development and so on. So there's the two horses. There's an old saying in Australia, you shouldn't be in the circus if you can't ride two horses at once. And Australia is, it's got a leg on the French horse, and I'll on a Pacific horse. And it's riding around in circles. It looks really good as long as the horses are heading in the right direction. And if the horses start going different ways, if you jump on the French horse, if you jump on the Pacific horse, or well, the third option is to fall flat in your face. Um, that's the challenge. I think it's a big challenge for Australia. It's also a challenge for Fiji and New Zealand and Tonga and everyone else. This is a moment where a new generation are saying enough is enough. We have to address our blue Pacific agendas about climate, about jobs, about the plague of violence against women in the home, the community, the workplace. And we need to do that together. Let's break the barrier of Melanesia, Micronesia, Polynesia and Franconesia. <laughs> you can't even don't want to be part of Franconesia anymore. They want to be part of the Pacific. And that's up to us. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the question. I'm in the hands of the organisers. I can talk about other issues if you believe me to. Um, there's some real experts in the room. I bow to the knowledge of the climate experts over here. And others. Um, questions online, I'll hand over to the chair people, but I'm sure that there's a mechanism if you want to send some uh, questions through. Um, um, the, the staff here will, will work with you to, uh, to pass them on. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Nick. And once again, if you could give an appreciation, you feel a lot of them. Um, 
I see the room has filled up really quickly during the course of this, this public lecture, but we'll maybe give a few questions to the online participants. I see some questions on, so it's uh, now I could give them up and then we can take a few from the floor. Uh, maybe we'll have this 30 minute discussion, but please feel free to ask questions. I'm not sure if our Canuck friends are online from the FNNKS. Rosa, can we get a clarification if we have anyone from FNNKS online who may want to also attend or maybe share a few comments? Je vois des bruits en français. S'il y a des questions en français, uh, c'est possible. Um, no question online for Noreen from Kiva. Um, from him. What about the outcomes in the French elections in the last few days? Is there anything that potentially shifts substantially now in terms of the French uh, part in terms of position in politics? Uh, we see rumblings from the far left that they will recognize Palestine in the next few weeks, but what about Canada? Yeah. My sense, but I'm, I'm not an expert on French domestic politics, so I follow it for obvious reasons, but it's quite complex. And the opinion polls got it wrong. Um, in the lead up to this vote, um, the extreme right wing party, Rassemblement National, which is the old National Front, racist, some say bad party, was doing really well in the, in the polls, in the polls. And there was a fear that they would capture the majority in the National Assembly, the French lower house of parliament. They didn't. Um, and indeed, there's a left alliance called the New Popular Front, which is uh, socialist, communist, Greens, and they group called France and Bauer, but also to me. So they become the largest bloc in the parliament, followed by four parties that make up what they call the presidential majority, Macron's party, President Macron's party, and some other ones, and then the far right. On, I haven't, I've been busy today, but the last figures I saw, no one's got a majority. You need 289 seats plus to have the numbers. That's been the case since 2022. And so to cobble together a, no, you know, to win a vote means some really weird alliances. No one quite knows what's going to happen. Um, President Macron has said that the current Prime Minister, Gabriel Attal, who's in caretaker mode, will stay there because France hosts the Olympics starting in July and through July, August, September. So they've got the world coming. <laughs> so, short answer, New Caledonia is largely invisible in this. The European Parliament elections were a few weeks ago, and I actually did the work to look at the electoral manifestos of the major groups. Only one out of the six or seven biggest groups mentioned New Caledonia. Um, the, and that was the new popular front, the left-wing bloc. And frankly, they had a paragraph which was essentially talking points from the airplane pairs. There was not much innovation. They were echoing, and they, and they are pledged to support that. Um, but all the other manifestos, including Macron's, did not mention New Caledonia in their electoral manifesto. Mm -hmm. So it's not high on the agenda. It is high because of the crisis. And there are many people like us concerned about the militarization, the role of the police, what's going to happen. But, frankly, they've got bigger fish to fry. So it's a problem, and people on all sides, particularly the business community, they need money for reconstruction. Uh, President Macron's pledged 250 million euros to help rebuild public infrastructure. And there's been a lot of damage, physical damage to schools and so on. But, you know, it's like they make an announcement and say, here's the money, but it's still to get passed through Congress, you know, spread before it gets to ordinary people. So many people I've spoken to, particularly in the business community, are really anxious that they took off because France had more on its plate. One of the key demands for months from the independence movement is that there are real an impasse in talks between supporters and opponents of independence about what comes next. They're supposed to negotiate under the Mir Accord after the referendums. They're supposed to come to a new deal on what comes next. Those talks have been dragging on. They haven't worked. And there's a complete breakdown of trust between the independent supporters and Macron and his overseas minister, Damana, um, and the guy who did the 2021 referendum. They called for a, a high level 
delegation of dignitaries to come um, with former French Prime Ministers, you know, statesmen and women. Um, the FLNKS wants specific representation. So there's a role for the forum, and you can think of names, Tawala, Taylor, there are many people with mana who know the issues and so on who might contribute to such an initiative. They want the UN involved. Now, I don't think France would be happy with that idea because that suggests that it's a regional security issue and not a matter for France. So, like, the real problem is there's a level of delay and uncertainty until we know who's the new government. They're wrapped up with the Olympics. So, I mean, the bandwidth in Paris is pretty narrow at the moment for this. I think the election of Chibao is an important circuit breaker because now there's a voice going to Paris to speak with some substance. Last year, for the first time ever, a Kanak was elected to the Senate, um, going to Robert Howey, who's a veteran politician. So in the French Senate and the National Assembly, there are now two spokespeople, so you don't have to talk through the French lefties, you have a voice, and that's why yesterday's vote was so important. And Chabot also, as I say, is not a standard politician. He's captured the aspirations of young people in ways. I think that's what he got him over the line. Um, that's an important generational change. But I think that's something we have to understand. There is a new generation out there. They're grappling with the same problems that we are, and they're looking to us as Australians, New Zealanders, Fijians, and so on, for partnership. Thank you. Nick, there is a question from uh, Sharon Baldwin. Um, so we can attempt that. Uh, Just that. Oh, okay. yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there are a number of different groups um, organizing women, and some of them are similar here. I won't go into all the details, but there are groups like the Soma Soma Bakamarama, traditional, uh, church based, you know, fairly conservative groups. And there are some feminist groups. There is a very active group called SOS Dialogue Sexuel, who are your counterparts. And I'm sure there's been historic connections with Shamima and others working with them. So there are strong networks. One of the unique things about New Caledonia is that there was a French law passed more than 20 years ago, 2001, called the Loi de Parité, which is a legal mechanism to ensure representation of women in Parliament. So they're slightly different to us. They use a list system, an electoral list. So you vote for a list of one party or one group. You have to have 50% women on the list. And to stop the idea of the blokes up the top, the women down the bottom, they have what they call a zipper thing. They have man, woman, man, woman, man, woman, man, woman, all the way down the list. So half your list gets elected, or a quarter of your list, half of it will be women. So currently, the Congress in New Caledonia, 46% women. Think about PNG Parliament. Think about Vanuatu Parliament, or the Tuvalu Parliament. Women aren't in that public sphere in the way that they are in New Caledonia. So everyone says Hila Haini was the first woman um, to be elected. I'm sorry, 2004, Marino Temoro, President. Dewey Garode, sadly passed away. Poet, writer, activist, feminist, President and Vice President. They did it 20 years ago. They had two women in the top two jobs. So the Congress, 46% women, which most countries are shame, including my own. Uh, we, we took a long time to get a female prime minister. Um, so people better than most, but it's a problem in Melanesia. So there are strong women. They do have networks ranging from traditional uh, groups, uh, church affiliated mostly, Catholic and Protestant, but there are some stronger feminist groups so the parallels with Fiji are pretty much the same. And I'd maybe later to share some contacts and names for people who are there. Like women in conflict situations like the Solomons and Bougainville, there's an ambivalence. There's a support for connect nationalism, but there's an awareness about what boys with guns means mm -hmm. and what violence like this means, both in an immediate and in a psycho-traumatic way. People are going through a pretty traumatic thing. When your house is burnt down and your job goes, it's tough. I interviewed one of the key trade union leaders and said, what, what's, what do you think about all this? Oh, we support the youth. Good on them. 
but my members are a bit grumpy because they've oh, they lost their job. So, like, it's a complex situation. The people who've lived through crisis in Fiji will understand it reverberates. And I think we all live through COVID, that there's people who lose jobs, livelihoods and things. It takes a while to cut pieces. So, and we know women get lumped with a lot of that stuff in family life. They're the carers, they're the others. And women's employment is often more precarious. So when supermarkets get burnt down, women who work in the supermarkets are out of job. And that's so on employment, on family life, on get, getting jobs for their sons so their sons don't end up in prison. 90% of the prison, well, there is, they're sending some to Compass is, uh, to that prison in France is, apart from the political provocation, Compass is full. They arrested 1,500 people. 90% of prisoners before the crisis were Canadian. It's like Australia, Aboriginal people, Indigenous people are disproportionately represented in prison in the justice system because they get thrown in jail for things that a white fellow might get thrown in jail for. So already connect uh, disadvantaged in the justice system. So there's a lot of anger about what people call colonial justice. Um, and that's not being helped by sending people literally to the other side of the world to hold them in pre-trial detention. Because the obvious question is there's a couple of white civilians who killed people during the riots. They're not in jail in France. Long answer, short question, but it's an important one. Surprise, surprise. Chinese used to say women hold up half the sky. In the Pacific, it's about 80%. <laughs> That's true in New Caledonia. Yeah? <coughs> you know what it means. This sort of crisis reverberates through community life, and women are a vital part of that community life. And they're an important role in peace building and peacemaking. And we've learned that from both of them. We've learned that from Solomon. The role of the churches, of women's groups, of customary leaders, that's happening. That's why they'll get through this, because there are strengths and resilience in the community. But boy, it's been sorely stretched in the last few weeks. Yeah. I see a question from Ashley. Lessons for West Papua self-determination from the recent Kanaki experience. Lots. Independence, number one. Independence is a process. Not a moment. There's a before, there's where you win, and then there's when you do the hard work. Every independent country in the Pacific knows that there's a magic day when you lower the other flag and you put yours up. That day is coming. But what happens then? And that's why they've been trying for 25 years, this transition to take responsibility, to train the people needed to run the country because of the poor education standards, there's a reliance on French technocrats to do a whole range of jobs, and that's just taking time. Mm -hmm. So that's important for West Papua or Bougainville or anywhere else. Thinking about doing things. I'm proud that when I worked there early on, we got scholarships for 30 young Canucks after the troubles of the 80s. We organised scholarships for people to come to Australia to do a university degree. And part of it was to improve their English, part of it was to get a good university degree, but part of it was to live in a non-French environment <laughs> and see the world. So, USP, Fiji government, where's your scholarship program for the next generation of young Panak people who go on to be the leaders tomorrow? Not rocket science, that sort of opportunity, the building blocks. And for West Park ones, the Indonesians, understandably, like the French, don't want people coming out to the regional institutions. They have to send them to France. So that's a challenge. What role do we, governments, community, regional organisations like the Forum or SPC or USB, do? They're going to need meteorologists. They need doctors, whether they're independent or not independent. What do we play on that building blocks? That's a lesson for West Papua. Oh, thank you. Can I say one more? Unity. Um, every nationalist movement is complex. It's a national liberation front. And like every nation, there is a lot of politics. <laughs> um, and uh, there are arguments about what's the best way to do this. Through negotiation, 
through fighting in the streets, through mixed you know, like, this is politics. There have been moments where the independence movement has almost split. And they have, in fact, had deep debates. And there are significant differences about how we deal with this situation. Because we don't have the numbers as the connect people a minority. We have to win allies. So how do we win allies to get the numbers to move towards independence? That's happening with the Walesian people, because Walesians as fellow islanders understand the cultural notion that we are on the land of the indigenous people. And there is a cultural reciprocity and an understanding of that. And so you find that although the Walesian community by and large doesn't support independence, they work together around a common <laughs> agenda around housing and jobs and racism and education and training and so on. So you have Walesian, what they call the Islander majority in the Congress. So that is important for West Papua, thinking about how do you engage with people of Indonesian heritage? <laughs> Understanding the Indonesian military and the problem, how do you engage with people who have been born and bred in West Papua, coming from the days of transmigration? And that's a challenge in Tahiti and Guam, Guam where the Chamorro minority is difficult. But unity in action is important. They had an argument about whether they, who would run candidates, and in the end, everyone came together to back Emmanuel Chibao, despite political differences within the Epilin PS, mm -hmm. and he won. Thank you. Question about Azerbaijan. Uh, strongest supporters, not coming from Pacific, but from Azerbaijan, uh, supporting all the French colonies. I think it's awesome to have such a strong support from overseas. What do I make of this? I'm afraid I don't agree. Um, I think Azerbaijan is a distraction. It's being used by the French and by Australian think tanks, every security about to suggest that Azerbaijan is manipulating this crisis. Nonsense. I say, which was the foreign power behind Chief Atai's 1878 revolt as he rose up against the theft of land? Who was the foreign power behind Chief Noel in 1917 when they rose in the First World War? Who was behind the Kanak soldiers returning from World War II without the vote? First century of colonisation, Kanak, Indigenous, indigenous labourers and women didn't have to vote. Who got the vote in France after the Second World War? Think about that, sisters. Like, Azerbaijan is a distraction, and I'm sorry, Laurent, I don't agree that they are getting strong support. Azerbaijan has a, it's too complex to go into details. Azerbaijan is in diplomatic dispute with France over Armenia and Nagorno Karabakh. France backs Armenia against Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan is doing some theatre to support the French colonies. Um, it's theatre. I'm sorry. There is no substantial name. Azerbaijan, however, was the chair of the non aligned movement until February. New Caledonia? The FOK, sorry, FOKS is a member of the non-aligned movement, as is Fiji and Vanuatu and PNG. So the FOKS have been quite open that they are reaching out for international support. They have, from the very earliest days, reached out to neighbours, to the MSG, to the Forum, to the UN Special Committee on Decolonisation, the UN Human Rights Committee, and the non-aligned movement. So yes, there is a connection with Azerbaijan, I personally don't agree that it's strong support. I think it's a bit of theatre. Because, frankly, most Azerbaijani who I've ever met know nothing really about the South Pacific. Um, I'm also old enough to remember the days when the Russians were the bad guys and the Libyans. And people said the same thing, that the Libyans are behind all of this. Well, sorry. Most of the kids today don't know anything about Libya or Azerbaijan. This is about the colonial context and the policies of France. <laughs> People will make hay about it. I'm quite sure they track Azerbaijan's involvement and I bet you they're putting out some propaganda blagging on the French. The interesting one is China. Absolute radio silence from China. <coughs> their main interest is nickel. Guess who's the largest purchaser of nickel ore from New Caledonia? 
It ain't France. Number one, China. Number two, Japan. Number three, Korea. Number four, Taiwan. That's about number eight. And that's important because nickel is important for electric car batteries and things. It's a metal, strategic metal and so on. So there's a whole politics around resource exploitation and management. So there are geopolitical players, be it China or Azerbaijan or Australia or everyone else in the world who's watching what's going on. Some want to tweak France's nose, some don't. But this is a homegrown crisis. And I always say this, this problem was started not in Baku, not in Beijing. It was started in Paris. Mm. This is Macron's mess. The problem is that the government of people of New Caledonia are picking up the pieces. Now, I for one should say my sympathies for President Marco because he's the, the guy, first connect president in 40 years. He's got to create jobs, peace, whatever. That's where we need to step up. So I don't think anybody has a solution. I think Pacific Neighbours is a solution, frankly. And I'd like Pacific Neighbours to play a greater role. And I say as an Australian citizen, it's our fourth closest neighbour. We have a responsibility to it. Right-wing militias have been reined in. It's worrying. There was almost a tipping point um, when the riots began in early May, mid-May, people formed self-defence groups to protect their homes and businesses. You know, there was a lot of buildings being burnt down. People were scared. And roadblocks went up everywhere. Our roadblocks, their roadblocks, French roadblocks. Like, there was a period for a couple of weeks where there was a danger of it tipping over and it escalated from people throwing stones to people shooting each other. Mm. Serious. And it could go back to that, is my concern, as someone who's been visiting there for a long time. There are people, extreme right-wing people, living in the mere, and there are allegations that there are so-called militias, i.e. not just people looking out for their homes, carrying a baseball bat or a golf club or whatever, but people going out actively. There's a lot of concerns. There were some Fanac shot and killed by civilians. Um, police are investigating those cases. And they haven't been sent to jail in France, could I make a point? Mm -hmm. um, the courts are doing their work, but there's a lot of anger about that. I'm old enough to remember in 1985, people were arrested in Australia smuggling guns from Australia to New Caledonia uh, to arm some extreme Pienoir, Algerian people of Algerian descent who were really nasty militias. So it's a term of abuse in France. Milice, in the Second World War, the Milice were the people who collaborated with the, the Germans. They were the Vichy police and they tortured people. So it's a really strong insult in a French context to say someone's in a militia. It's a pretty serious thing to say to someone. You know, it resonates in a way in France because of the collaboration with Nazism back in the 20th century. Yes, there are a lot of guns. Last figures I saw about 72,000 registered firearms. That's a lot for a country of 268,000 people. And some estimate that there's another 30,000 or 40,000 unregistered guns. Hunting rifles, fair enough, <laughs> things like that. Most people in the bush have got a shotgun to go out hunting or, you know, whatever. Farming communities, obviously, have a 22 to kill animals that need killing and things. But there's an all lot of high power weapons as well. There's a real cowboy gun culture in New Caledonia, and that's a serious problem. Uh, because, as I say, it escalated pretty quickly with people holding firearms. And the police say they should have a monopoly of violence, which is why they've got armored cars going in, but that escalates pretty quickly, and I think there's a real problem with that. But can I? are aware of the danger. The balance of force is not good. So that's why they call on the young people to come off the barricades and vote for Emmanuel. And they did. <laughs> you know, some of the action faction are out fighting police officers. Think, why should I vote for a politician? But they came in numbers and he got 50, 44% in the first round, 
57%. Astounding victory. From a snap start, like that three weeks of campaign. Pretty amazing. And that and on my own nice land, the round for the southern province, you didn't win. She got 47%, 52, something 47. That's astounding against Metzdorf, the who's the member of the parliament already. So there's a base for people not wanting to go to war. Once again, Fijians will understand. And I've been, I've been through a couple of coups here myself. Um, <laughs> Let's try to work if we can. There is a, a hope. And I think that's the challenge when the French police believe that they can calm things down by using armored cars. Not going to work. I think we have a responsibility as citizens of the city to make that point publicly. So thank you. Can we take some few questions from the floor? Please. And um, how does the proposed specific government or governments within the region like Australian and New Zealand governments um to suit the support for local societies? Maybe a little bit to do with the So I'm ready, I'm ready. Um we've worked in the research where I'm from Australia and I'm from the university on a study to and BD like about regionalism and um people. Well, as a classic example, last November, for my sins as a journalist, I just fly around the city with my carbon points are a nightmare. Um, I went to Rarotonga to report on the Pacific Islands Forum, and then I jumped on my magic carpet and flew directly from Rarotonga to Namia. All the magic carpets were in fact booked up, and so I had three days to get across because the Colonial Airlines don't connect. So, And the Pacific Conference of Churches held their General Assembly in New Caledonia. Um, every five years, the PCC, the main ecumenical organisation, brings together church leaders from all around the region. I remember James Budwan, the Secretary General, um, organised to take the churches of the Pacific to New Caledonia, knowing that this was coming. Not maybe knowing how it would explode, but knowing that this was brewing and that the churches had to use their prophetic voice to speak truth to power. And so I was, my boss was actually involved in the PCC, so he said I didn't fly all the way and report on that, so I did. And before the meeting, the official church meeting, the assembly, they held a series of smaller meetings beforehand. They had a women's meeting in Kanawa, a youth meeting at Donebo and Wailu, which is on the east coast, and the leaders flew out to Liku, one of the outlying loyalty islands, to the very church where the founding meeting of the Pacific Conference was held, Churches was held in 1966. Mm -hmm. Lifu was the first meeting of the main ecumenical movement, church movement. And I hadn't been back in 56 years. So they decided to go there. Now I, for my students, I told them the sense of humour, decided that I shouldn't go to the women's meeting, I should go to the youth meeting. So I was sent young at heart in the bus with all the young people, and I reported on the youth meeting. If you go to the Islands Business website, you can see the story through at that time. And so there were young people. Olivia Barrow was with us today from the PCC, and um, Viral Fulway, connect wonderful connect youth leader from Shane from PNG. People from all over the city came together. People like young like yourselves to talk about what's our agenda: climate, jobs. There's a whole manifesto, and they took that to the General Assembly to talk to the church elders, who can I say are generally a bit more conservative than the youth. <laughs> um, women organised, because there's a big problem with violence in the churches. There's a certain level of hypocrisy in church institutions about the status of women and the secret violence that goes on, even amongst the people of faith. So the women had a very strong demand of the church leader. So there are spaces that exist, some of them formal, some of them informal. So great, you're here. This is one of those spaces, thank you, FW60, where people from different backgrounds but common agendas can work together. And those networks exist in the Pacific, and for us people from Australia, we sometimes don't know that those exist. So Australian journalists all went to the forum to argue about China things. And I was the only Australian journalist who went to hang out with the church leaders. So think about that. When's they and you going to send you guys to New Caledonia? 
That fourth place is Nabal. Serious question. Because there's certainly visibility in the Australian media and Australian academia about our Frank of our neighbors. Mm -hmm. We have a question here. Um, Heather, my name's Ben, I'm also from AMU. Um, I was hoping you might be able to comment a little bit further about sort of um, strategic questions for the independence movement. You mentioned that there are sort of questions of, or importance of political unity, um, and that might be fractioned and afraid by questions of, I guess, violence and civil disruption as part of the movement. Um, I guess I'd be interested if you could maybe comment on some of the sort of, yeah, the, the, the fissures, um, the political fissures around the strategy, and I guess what do you think the role of civil disruption is in terms of a successful independence movement? It's hard to say, I'm an observer. I'm not actually part of these discussions, and I can't pretend to speak. I mean, I know a lot about it, I've been going there for a while, but I'm not connect. I am a visitor, um, and I'm not privy to some of those debates. I know a bit about it because I'm a sneaky journalist and I ask people and you know they tell me stuff and things like that. But I, I, I want to put that on the record. I'm speaking as an observer of New Caledonia. I certainly don't have any mandate to speak for the New Caledonia people of any ethnicity, let alone the Kanak people. So I put that on the record because it's important to say they have their own voices, they have their own strategies, and they discuss that, as we all do, behind closed doors. There are disagreements because it's complex. How do you, in the 21st century, deal with the geopolitics of the world? We all know that the US strategic competition with China dominates geopolitical life. You only have to read the Australian media to know that China is the story. And I write a lot about the other C words, climate and colonialism. <laughs> You know, and um, the blue Pacific agenda is to try and look at that geopolitical context. So, Kanak leaders, New Caledonians of all ethnicities, both supporters and opponents of independence, are grappling with the changing world. And it's like everywhere China is their biggest trading partner, number one for nickel export oils. But many people in New Caledonia are Christian, conservative, and don't like communists. So they're grappling with China just like we all are. Can I say, the failure of the Australian media, and I say this is an Australian journalist, is many of the problems that New Caledonia faces are not New Caledonia problems. <laughs> they are global problems. Climate change is called global warming for a reason. It is a global problem. And if any of you have lived through the bushfires, you'll know that Australia is grappling with the climate emergency, just as our neighbouring countries. The plague of violence against women and children in families and workplaces, sexual harassment, is a common problem across the world, including Australia. How do you deal with China? How do you deal with transnational corporations that want to rip off your resources? These are global challenges, and New Caledonians are grappling with those just like we all are. You split deep in mind, don't you? Some countries say it's a matter of sovereignty, um, that we have few resources, so we need to exploit the ocean resources to provide jobs, help education for our people. That's what Cook Islands and Nauru and who's an excellent long say. Others say, no, it's crazy, proportionary principle, we should do it. New Caledonia is with the no camp. The government of Louis Mapu says, we have a World Heritage Era listed, we have beautiful reefs, we have a World Heritage listed marine area, we need to protect it. So they're grappling with the same problems. So I don't present it in the notion that there's splits and things. I mean, of course there are political splits. <laughs> oh, they go over here. Oh. Um, no, I'm sorry, it's politics. They argue, surprise, you know, sorry, it's life. People have different opinions about how do we address these global challenges. Some believe, like the climate movement, that you do it by going to a cop and through five persuasions. Others think you jump in front of a coal ship and put your body on the line. Okay? There's no wrong signs. There, you know, and probably you do both. Yeah? You lobby and you yell. You speak in quiet voices where you're loud like me. I mean, that's the New Caledonian split. So I don't, I don't the promise to be question is all these factions. Well, yeah, it's a nice surprise. Yes, like the Labour Party in Australia, there are differing attitudes of how we bring about change in a complex world. They're doing it in a colonial context where they are hemmed in by French law and French police officers. 
So I have to give them the credit that those decisions that they're making, and they are making life and death decisions. West Parklands are making even more life and death decisions. Long and Williams made life and death. 20,000 people died in the Bogan War. So this is a regional issue. And where Fiji and Australia and New Zealand and others stand to address these. So I don't, I, mean, I can't speak about splits in the movement because they're not splits, they're politics. They're talking about how do we deal with the world around us. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm going to ask about the, what should be a regional um, response. And maybe I will frame it around the Pacific has had to deal with France since 1971 in so many different ways. The Forum, we saw it in the nuclear. Uh, movement now, decolonization now has come back up. So, but I think one thing that has come up in the last year or so is the idea by Rambuco of ocean of peace, the zone of peace. If you were able to advise all, no, let's maybe not ask that, but what should be learning from the lessons of the past? Um, what should be in this zone of peace or ocean of peace? Or the principles be there, and, and, and if you do not have a response, what should be there? Yeah. What should we not be doing? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, slightly different answer about the zone of peace. I'm a great believer in human rights and international law. Others are in favour of the rules-based order. Mm -hmm. You hear that from the Americans, the Australians, a lot, and so on. I think they're different things. <clears throat> And I think, for example, God, sorry, don't be on your fellow, only the Gaza crisis has shown that. But the terrible human rights violations that are there, there are international institutions that we've created since the Second World War, like the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court, that are grappling with the fact that both the Israeli government and Hamas have committed human rights violations that are crimes under international law. And... They've been attacked for doing their work as human rights workers. The US president says that the Indian criminal court shouldn't have dared to criticize Israel. So the rules-based order is different to international law. And Pacific Island countries, and I think many citizens, have always tried to defend international law because they have fought to expand the notion of international law to address specific realities. BG was a champion of the law of the sea. I'm not enough to remember it. Most people in the room weren't, but BG led the fight in many ways for the law of the sea. Sachin Anand was the first leader of the International Seabed Authority from BG. Rajumara was government for all it seems. did really amazing things in those times because Pacific Islanders, surprise, surprise, knew that controlling the ocean, expanding the notion of rights over the ocean was benefit. Pacific countries were at the heart of the fight over the Convention on Biodiversity and the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. From the beginning, people knew that sea level rise was going to be us in the Pacific. So these people in the Pacific have fought citizens and governments to expand around nuclear disarmament, around climate and so on, and we're in that world. But that world is under challenge when, be it Russia or America or China or whatever, is more interested in rules-based order than they rule. So I think there's a question about how we defend that. And for me, on this topic, the right to self-determination mm -hmm. is at the heart of international human rights law. Has been from day one. <coughs> I don't know if you're into reading old documents. Convention on Civil and Economic and Political Rights, Article 1, includes the right to self-determination. <laughs> Every UN Human Rights Convention, including the modern ones like the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Declaration, talks about the right to self-determination. And we have situations where in the Pacific, people distinguish between the right to self-determination and human rights as if they're separate things. So you have, speaking bluntly, MSG leaders will go to the Indonesia and say, we'll talk about human rights, we won't talk about the right to self-determination. I'm sorry, the right to self-determination is the human right. It's about people's determining their own future. So that's important. And I think that's a battle that's being played out in the region. Second one is about bringing specific perspectives into this. George has well, wrote a chapter from a book that George is editing about oceanic diplomacy. There are many ways that people in the Pacific use cultural 
customary ways to bring harmony back to the community, to resolve problems, to address maritime boundary disputes and so on. And there's a, over the coming months, we're having to get out a book on this very question. Um, there are strengths in the way we work. I say this an outsider, but it's an insider because I've been working on this sort of stuff for a while, that we should use those methods, often informal, often based on everything from church to custom to playing rugby together at USP and knowing people, you know, so that. And there are all sorts of ways that we network. That's important to build on. The other thing the forum said is there's a role to promote Talanoa in this new Catalonian situation. And that needs some courage from our government to take on the French, who, compared to the 20th century, are actually saying we are your buddies. On climate change, for example, in recent years, when we had Donald Trump in the White House and Scott Morrison in Canberra, the French were actively going around the region saying, hey, we believe in climate change. It's called the Paris Agreement on Climate Change for a reason, you know. And you see through France, by that play, through um, uh, the EU funding and so on, that France has improved its diplomatic relations with the region compared to the time when they let up 193 nuclear weapons at Lord Ryan Pagatopa and blew up the Rainbow Warrior and killed people in Kanaki in 1985. So France is a partner in the geopolitical sphere but France's agenda is around the Indo-Pacific strategy. It's about the rules-based order. Mm -hmm. And I think it's incumbent on us to bring them back and talk about international law. I went to see some diplomats recently, I won't name which country, mm -hmm. and said, could you stop saying France is a Pacific nation? France is not a Pacific nation. France is a European nation. And under international law, the UN used in jargon, it's the administering power of a non self governing territory. Yeah. It's a colonial power. You and this bit more blind than I am. France is a colonial power. It's a European colonial power. It colonized New Caledonia in 1853 and is still hanging on. And that's what the UN General Assembly says every year. So can we say it too? And can we call on France and our diplomats, our partners? Well, friends, go to the other small states. I used to go and drink their wine all the time. They're nice people. Um, you have a responsibility to decolonize. That's at the heart of the UN project. has been since day one. And most of the world has decolonized. Why are we here a quarter of the way through the 20th century, 21st century, still grappling with this? Not rocket science. We are at a moment where this is on the table. Will France try to put back the clock? Or will they acknowledge that the Connect people ain't going anywhere? And they've made their point of view pretty clear. Not just the 1980s generation, but the 20 year olds and the 25 year olds and the people in our vintage. So, Helen In 2021, the forum sent a mission. The New Caledonia to monitor the third referendum. It was an important mission. Secretary General Henry Bunner of the Pacific Islands Forum, Batunoka Kumbobola, leading Fijian statesman, um, and uh, Paturi Elisaya, Samoa, former UN ambassador. They wrote a really important report. And when you read it, it's online now. It wasn't online for a long time, but it's just gone online recently. Interesting. Um, it talks about the failure of this referendum in terms of its legitimacy, its credibility, its process. So it echoed concerns that were raised by the Canadian independence movement. Why not send a mission now? France is a partner. Why not just send a ministerial mission to talk with all people, French government, anti-independence parties, pro independence parties, churches, women, both people, young people. It was a good mission last time. Do it again. Mm -hmm. Don't have to take positions. Don't have to take sides. Just go talk to people. Paranoia. That's what we do. And I think there's a space, a window of opportunity to do that. If this idea of a high-level mission of dignitaries from France, why not the city governments ask whether they can get involved? We bring something to the table as particularly people from the MSU countries. 
and we know them sitting. So I think there are avenues without necessarily challenging French sovereignty. Many will want to, but it's diplomacy. There are ways that the forum can break the impasse, because that's where we're at. There's an impasse in political dialogue about where we go for the future. The last, the, I'm hoping the elections and Chibao being the symbol of that moment will change the mood. Not my country, we'll see. But unless you address the poverty and the jobs and whatever, there's going to be more trouble. So, public have a role to play too. Um, I understand that there's a rally in Fiji. I'm a journalist, I won't be here. But some of you may wish to join it on Friday. Mm -hmm. yeah. Break the silence. I'm pleased to be with you to talk. You have to talk about this. It's complex, difficult. Not my country, but I'm suggesting this is a regional issue. This is not a matter for France. Mm -hmm. And whether we're citizens or governments, or churches or women or whatever. Through our institutions, we have a role of play in talking about it, sharing the voices. Your next meeting, invite someone from Connecticut to come and speak rather than tell my fellow. Seriously, little bits build up. There are Connect students at the Theological College here in Fiji. How are they going? They've got friends, family, probably in Toronto. Give them a feed. Look after them. Small large, there are things we can all do to reach out with our friends. Thank you for your attention. I hope there's still a few people out there. Um, they have it less. We conduct your own considering time. Um, I just say, well, let's take one last question. Yeah, um, we could, we've been waiting for an afternoon, so we could, I'll ask him, 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 i will ask him 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 how obviously it is a small population, but follow something like the New Zealand and Cook Island uh, Association, and what there is, what Australia's role is to kind of have, having a big place in the city. You know, to have right on our own hands. Yes. Yes. I'm embarrassed to say that, like most Australians, I don't know, have any big, very good context in Norfolk, so I don't actually know what Norfolk Islanders want, whether they want some sort of association and so on. So I don't think I should pontificate it. Because they're sort of invisible in Australian politics and things. I think the general principle is there, though, about the notion of self determination. Because it's complex. We have countries that are listed with the UN Special Committee on Decolonization in our region Guam, Samoa, New Caledonia, we listed in 1986, French Polynesia, Maui Nui, we listed in 2013. There are, however, other self-determination struggles around the region that don't fall within the mandate of that 19th century. The obvious one, Bougainville, mm -hmm. Papua New Guinea, West Papua, mm -hmm. Indonesia, Japan, you know, there's all sorts of things, Tokelau with New Zealand. Um, you know, there are some... And then the struggle of Indigenous peoples in Pacific Rim countries, mm -hmm. like Amali in Hawaii, mm -hmm. Aboriginal Torres Strait Islanders claiming their sovereignty, and uh, the Australians in the room will know we just voted against the voice. Um, but many a Kanaka said to me, We don't want to end up like your Aborigines. You know, because of that. And the French people say, Why are you talking about New Caledonia? Why aren't you talking about your Aborigines? It's a legitimate question because Australians will understand that this is a complex question. How do you recognize indigenous sovereignty in multi racial, multicultural societies? Fijians understand and grapple with that question. Every nation in many ways is grappling with it. France is grappling with it. Because France says you're French. They don't acknowledge that they're French, young French people of Arab and African heritage who are living in the squatter settlements around Paris <laughs> are just as angry as young Canaks about the poverty of urban life. 
So, I'm sorry, I can't answer the question on Novi Island, but that's a good question. I think I'm going to read a bit about it. Um, I would say generally Australia is very reluctant. I haven't heard Penny Wong ever use the word decolonisation. But I went looking once. The last person to talk about decolonisation was Kevin Rudd in 2012, I think it was. I'd have to go back and look again. And he was talking about Western Sahara, <laughs> <laughs> which is on the, on the list of, uh, um, not sort of governing territories, the last the African bits that, you know. It's wrong for Canberra. Wrong for Suva. Many peoples in the Pacific want to determine their own political, social, cultural future. And the lines on the map that divide it are the lines within Australia and the lines around the region. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. People are trying to transcend those colonial boundaries mm-hmm. and think about the Great Moana. You know, how do we transcend the colonial boundaries that have been created by the colonial process? And the tragedy is the colonial process is not done in this region, yeah. even in the 20th century. And it's not easy. Um, but many governments shy away from it because it annoys their key development partners. And it's up to citizens to say, no, this is a regional issue. And reality intervenes. New Caledonia was bubbling away quite nicely and people were riding the French horse and the <laughs> the New Caledonia horse at the same time. Well, the horses are running wild as we speak. Bougainville is calm and quiet. I'm sorry, in your lifetime, I think in my lifetime, Bougainville ain't going to be calm and quiet. The issue of people wanting to improve their future is with us. And that's some of the Scottish heritage, can I say? We haven't forgiven the English either. <laughs> no, no, there are us and couple arms. You know, this is the what you know used to be called the national question. You know, the nation state is in flux and states meld and break up. Czechoslovakia separated, Germany reunited, the Soviet Union imploded, Yugoslavia went through a horrible war. I mean, language, culture, religion, ethnicity, this is people are grappling with it in a global. We still live with the colonial powers like Britain and France and the United States and New Zealand that still have colonies in our region. Shouldn't be. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Please join me. Uh, all of you are We would also like to acknowledge our virtual participants. Thank you so much for making time uh, uh, within Silver uh, and throughout the Pacific. Thank you.